morning, everyone. Welcome to our 10 a.m. service. Let's begin with the call to worship from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Gracious Lord, thank you for allowing us to rise. Not just today, but rise from death to life as we have followed you, Lord. I pray this morning this service will be holy and pleasing before you, that we worship you with a humble and contrite heart, that we give you our very best in praise, in honor, in seeking you and following you, in being obedient to the truth of your word. Lord, may our praise, may the word spoken, may the fellowship all honor you properly. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let us pray. Our Father, our God, as we stand at the beginning of this new year, we confess our need for your presence and your guidance as we face the future. We each have our own hopes and expectations for the years ahead of us, but you alone know what is hold for us, and you alone can give us the strength and wisdom that we will need to meet the challenges. So help us, Lord, humbly put our hands into your hands and trust you and seek you and your will in our lives during the coming year and days. In the midst of our life's uncertainties in the days ahead, assure us of the certainty of your unchanging love. In the midst of our inevitable disappointments and heartaches, help us to turn to you for the stability and comfort we will need. In the midst of our temptations and the pull of our stubborn self-will, help us not to lose our ways, but to have the courage to what is right in your sight, regardless of the cost. Lord, we pray uh, as we continue to serve, we pray for our leaders, our pastors, our elders, our deacons and deaconess. Let us continue to serve you faithfully, willingly, and joyfully. Lord, open our hearts and our minds uh, so that we can just come to, to church, come to serve you uh, in the ways that you want us to do so. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us far beyond what we have deserved. May we never presume your past goodness or forget all your mercies to us, but may uh, they instead lead us to repentance and new commitment to you and make foundation in you the center of our lives. Lord, be with uh, Elder Peter as he gives us your message. Uh, let your Holy Spirit fill this space. Let us be uh, the congregation and Christians that you want us to be. This I ask in the name of our Lord Savior, who by his death and resurrection has given us hope both in this world and the world to come. Amen. Uh, let us remain standing as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, and our Lord. This is he by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Jesus of Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Good to see some of our younger generation. Michael. Okay. So if you have any questions about this, certainly ask me afterwards, okay? All right. So uh, this morning's sermon is going to be uh, the majority that Pastor Kim preached last week at the 12 p.m. sermon for the EM. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, in the first sermon of the year, he sets the motto and the vision for the ministry. And I believe it's important that all of our ministries uh, are on the same page with respect to that. So that is why we're doing it. Uh, it is not word for word, but it is mostly. So I will say and put out this caveat, if you have any issues, uh, the issues are with me and not with Pastor Kim, and you can come discuss them with me. With that said, let's turn to the scripture reading for today. It is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. 
you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Amen. Now there's a church in Brooklyn Heights. It's called Plymouth Church, and it's approximately 175 years old. About 100 years ago, at the end of a service, there was an African-American grandmother who stood up at the end of the service and asked to give a testimony of thankfulness. The pastor, Henry Ward Beecher, allowed her to speak. She stood up and said that about 60 years ago, when she was 12 years old, she was part of a family of four. They were part of a slave auction that was being held across the street from the church. They prayed that they wouldn't be separated as a family. But the father was sent to a farm, the mother to a restaurant, and the brother to a factory. She was left alone, and the bid on her was $700. No one bid for her. Maybe because they thought she was too young to help with physical labor. Then an old gentleman stood up and bid 700 and she followed him out. They then went to Plymouth Church across the street, and she found out that every month the members would make offerings in that amount to buy one potential slave's freedom. She was so thankful for her freedom that she worked hard every day and saved everything she could. She was so thankful to this church that she made an offering at that time of $70,000. Translated in today's uh, currency, it's about a million. Plymouth Church was in the forefront of the abolitionist movement, and God used it for great purposes. That church became highly respected by society for its actions against the injustice of slavery. Now every year, as Pastor Kim prays about the annual motto for CPC, he was reading today's passage in Thessalonians, and it came to him, the title, An Exemplary Believer, A Respected Church. That's what the Thessalonian church was. It was filled with exemplary believers and was a respected church. This church was originally established by Paul and Silas. They were very successful in witnessing to the Jewish proselytes in Thessalonica. Now a Jewish proselyte is a Gentile who wanted to convert to Judaism. Because of Paul and Silas' success in converting these Gentiles who had converted to Judaism and now were uh, members of the body of Christ, a group of Jews were very angry, and they brought false charges of treason against Jason and other Christians in Thessalonica. Treason then and now is a very, is a very serious charge. They claimed that the Christians were disobeying Caesar and say, saying there was another king named Jesus. Oddly enough, they were wrong about Jason and right about Jesus though not for the reasons they thought. Jesus is indeed the real king, but the Roman government wouldn't allow worship of someone other than Caesar. Ultimately, the officials acted properly and didn't prosecute Jason and the brothers. Instead, they took a bond of money and released them. Because Jason and others would have to give up the bond if the Jews created more trouble, Paul and Silas had to leave Thessalonica. After their departure, Paul heard, Paul heard good news about his former church. Then he dispatched Timothy to confirm their status. Timothy brought great news to Paul. 
And this is referenced in today's verses 7 through 8. Starting from 7. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. Now the word example in Greek is tupos, from which we get the English word type. It's exact copy. Word of the faithful lives of the Thessalonian Christians was everywhere. And their exemplary lives made them the model for other churches in the region. Macedonia was the province in northern Greece, and that contained Thessalonica, Philippi, and Berea. Achaia was the southern province of Greece, and that contained such large and prominent cities as Athens and Corinth. The geographic spread alone shows the significant impact that these exemplary believers had. Just to recall, at that time, consider the communication, the infrastructure, and transportation. For word to get around to that geographic area took significant time and effort. This was quite astounding when you think about it. Now, CPC is 42 years old. How can we be a respected church? Well, certainly, we all have to pray and work hard in the spirit. In order to be a respected church, we have to be exemplary believers. So then, how do we become exemplary believers? In looking back to the church at Thessalonica, there are similarities in the Plymouth Church. So point one for today, the church that works through faith is commended. Here's another story about the Plymouth Church. At that time, racial animosity was a serious issue and Plymouth Church was a leader in the abolitionist movement, which was an organized effort to abolish slavery. This movement started in the 1800s in Great Britain and then moved to America. Plymouth Church took a strong stand on this issue 14 years before the start of the Civil War. The church had built a new sanctuary, but it was firebombed one night by those who opposed their stance on abolition. At that point, the members must have been in despair at seeing all of their time, effort, and offerings go up in smoke. But rather than crushing the church, it was actually a turning point for them. After news of the arson spread, many people came to support Plymouth Church. They were people who had silently been against this type of hatred, but not willing to speak out either for lack of faith or lack of courage, or both. At that time, Plymouth, took, Plymouth Church took the lead in something just. They began to collect offerings to build a new church, and then one person stood out. He was the founder of Domino Sugar, which is still <coughs> in Brooklyn today. They built a new, larger facility that seated 2,800 members. God rewarded them with this new, bigger facility. When faith is put into action, that's when you become a respected church. But it wasn't just the head pastor leading and doing all of the work. It was the whole congregation. Are you familiar with Jackie Robinson? I know several of you are baseball fans. On April 15, 1947, he became the first African-American player in the major leagues when he was called up by the Brooklyn Dodgers. He had a 10-year career and made such a significant impact in the sport and in society that in 1997, the 50-year anniversary of his rookie year, Major League Baseball retired as number 42. But there was an even more important person related to this achievement than Mr. Robinson. His name was Branch Rickey, and he, would, he was an executive for the Dodgers, and he was the one who signed Jackie. Ricky was a member of Plymouth Church, and he was inspired by his pastor's stance on supporting freedom for slaves. He wanted to step forward to make a difference in society. He was the one who scouted and signed Robinson to a, major, to a minor league contract. Ricky was taking a big risk on signing Robinson because
because the public at large and his own teammates might not accept him. But Ricky followed the lead of his pastor and stood up to the backlash. Robinson earned the respect of his teammates and others in baseball through his stellar play on the field and his character and resilience both on and off the field. There is a story about the interview process that Branch Rickey had with Jackie Robinson. And Mr. Rickey made it clear that he did not want Jackie to respond to the racial taunts that would happen. So apparently Robinson said, well, do you want someone who's too afraid to respond and fight? And he said, no, I want somebody who's smart enough to not respond in that way, essentially to turn the other cheek. Now let's look more closely at today's passage in verse 3, where it says, Remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Their work of faith was evident in the face of harsh opposition. Faith is not an abstract concept. It is shown through action. Let's look at James chapter 2, verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. How can we become a respected church? Not by words alone. Because just saying you believe doesn't mean anything. You have to put your faith into action. Without putting faith in action, no one can really know if it's true. We hope and pray that all of CPC and its members who put their faith in real action will do so every day for the Lord. Point two, the church that labors with love is to be commended. There's another story about the Plymouth Church. When you think about the Civil War, who's the first leader that you think about? Probably President Abraham Lincoln. But as noted previously, 14 years before the war, Plymouth Church was a leader in the abolitionist movement. Lincoln had wanted to support this movement, and he was further convicted by the church's strong stance on the issue when he attended Plymouth. There was a member of the church who published a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Lincoln read the book and was challenged by its stance on slavery. He came to Plymouth Church and met the author, Harriet Beecher Stowe. The church still commemorates pew number 89, where Lincoln sat and prayed as a member well before he became president. What was Miss Stowe like? She lost her mother at age five and lived with a deep sense of mourning and loss. But she received the right influence from her father, who was also against slavery, by listening to the sermons of her brother, Henry Ward Beecher. One day, Miss Stowe saw a slave auction. She compared the loss of her mother to illness versus slave children losing their mothers at auctions. She realized that her sorrow was nothing compared to what these children were going through. She then sought a way to help them. While she was praying, she received inspiration from the Lord and wrote the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Other members of Plymouth Church stepped forward in faith, business people, Mr. Ricky, and all others participated together. The key point is that it wasn't just the work of one person. The entire congregation has to work through love to be a respected church. The labor of love referred to in verse 3 refers to the fact that love reveals itself in action. As we've discussed previously, godly love is not sympathy, sentimentalism, or fuzzy feelings that stay for a while and then pass. Godly love is self-sacrifice without expecting anything in return. Part of that sacrifice means overcoming hardship or persecution. As we know from the great passage in 1 Corinthians 13, love endures all things. Now let's look again at James. 
Go back to chapter 2, verses 16 to 17, where it says, And one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Who do you think represents this statement the most? Of course, it's our Lord Jesus who fulfilled this by dying on the cross for us. His faith in action was taking on all of our sins and bearing the wrath of God in our place. The Apostle Paul also labored in love through tremendous persecution and hardship for all of the churches he planted and supported. He was stoned, imprisoned, publicly flogged multiple times, shipwrecked, constantly in danger from those who either wanted to kill him or to see him fail. But he saw everything in terms of advancing the gospel and never swayed from the work of God's great kingdom. One way we can show faith in action in CPC is to accept roles of service in the body of Christ. Every year, we assign roles of stewardship in the congregation through positions such as deacon, director, or teacher, or in other capacities. By accepting these roles and then faithfully, diligently, and lovingly following through, we will show true faith and love in action. We are all called by God to be stewards of his church. Now let's talk about stewards and owners. A steward is not an owner, but is given something by the owner to be responsible for it. Christ is the head and owner of this church, and he places us in stewardship roles. One very good test of character is how someone will treat something that is not theirs. The way the steward, will they give it their best effort? Will they treat it as precious? The way the steward treats what the owner has placed under their care shows everything about what they think of the owner. Now compare stewardship versus ownership. If we're the owners of something, who decides what to do with it? We do. Then everything shifts to our wisdom, our strength, and our priorities. Do we think any of these will be superior to God's wisdom, strength, and priorities? There's a good reason why it's God's church and not our own. Recall our discussion from last week about the unique gifts that Jesus has given to each of us. How through his great work in the church, we are both united in Christ and unique in Christ. 1 Peter 4, verse 10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Friends, God has given us something precious. He gave himself. And now God is calling us to show our love and faithfulness through action, just like he did. Let's go to point three. The church that endures with hope is to be commended. Let's look again at verses three and five to six from today's passage. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. First, <clears throat> what is the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ? It's the firm expectation of both seeing and partaking in his future glory and inheritance. Let me repeat that. It's the firm expectation of both seeing and partaking in his future glory and inheritance. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again 
to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Apostle Peter makes the declaration of blessing as a surety. There is absolutely no doubt. He lifts up praise to God because of the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hope in our Lord is not theoretical or abstract. We have this living hope because he is alive. Therefore, godly hope has no doubt and goes far beyond human wishful thinking because it is founded on the unflinching trust in the fulfillment of Scripture. It is founded on the unflinching trust in the fulfillment of Scripture. The word that comes before this phrase in verse 3, steadfastness, is based on the idea of endurance or perseverance through constant pressure. Combining the two, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus means we will trust the promises of Christ no matter what the situation is in this world, even to the point of death. Because for the true Christian, what is death here? It's the end of this temporal existence, and it's the beginning of our eternal glory in Christ. How then can we endure through the power and joy of the Holy Spirit? Verse 5 says, Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. The gospel comes in the words of truth, both from and about Jesus. To transform the sinner from spiritual death requires the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. God gave power to the disciples through the Holy Spirit when he ascended to heaven after the resurrection. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. We are able to endure because of the power of the Holy Spirit giving us life together with our Lord. Verse 6 focuses on both affliction and joy of the Holy Spirit. It says, And you become imitate, became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. It may seem paradoxical that the Thessalonians received the word in much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Affliction can also be translated as tribulation, which means intense pressure. This is related to our early discussion on steadfastness, where we persevere through constant pressure. The Thessalonians didn't just make an intellectual choice for accepting Christ. They were under intense and constant pressure specifically because of Christ, because they accepted Christ. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Notice in verse 2 that it says, when you meet trials of various kinds. For the faithful, trials and testing of various kinds will come. It's not a question of if, but when. But the purpose of such trials is not to tear us down, but to make us complete and lacking in nothing. This is part of the process of spiritual maturity. God has told us this ahead of time 
and empowered us to face them with the joy of his Holy Spirit. Human joy is entirely dependent upon circumstances, which, as we know, can change like the direction of the wind. But joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, and that fruit produces unflagging joy in the face of trials and afflictions. Which takes us to point four. The church that waits for the Lord's return is commended. Verses 9 through 10 in today's passage states, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The members of this church displayed a total rejection of their former worship of idols to then serve the true and living God. The Greek word for turned is used in the New Testament to refer to a sinner's complete about face, a 180 degree turn. This conversion comes about because of repentance that then leads to saving faith. Jesus preached the gospel of repentance. Mark chapter 1, 14 to 15 says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He also led us to repentance through grace. Acts chapter 11, verse 18 says, When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Repentance is not a popular topic. Why? Because it tells us that we are sinful people who need to repent that we brought nothing to a holy and just God. But repentance is absolutely essential to true saving faith. Let's look at the elements. Repentance is an element of and essential to this saving faith. Repentance consists of two parts. One, turning from sin and forsaking it. And two, turning toward God. In part one, turning away from sin and forsaking it, there is a transformation of the will away from the former lusts of the flesh. It's a redirecting, if you will. It's not just about grief regarding sin and sin's consequences, which are significant and life-changing. Repentance brings about a deep sense of mourning for offending a holy and righteous God. Let me repeat that. Repentance brings about a deep sense of mourning for offending a holy and righteous God. Human grief over sin's earthly consequences is self-focused. It's all about, well, what happened to me, and this is a bad result, and let me find a way out of this. But the realization that sin has made us enemies of God with eternal consequences, that is God-focused. That prevents us from having this misguided notion that Jesus is here to fix our problems and improve our lives. In part two, we turn toward God because sin has been replaced by righteousness as a master. And the predominant choices we make are toward what is good and pure away from our prior sinful pattern. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 
We know repentance is true when it shows up in our lives. This is consistent with the theme that we've been discussing today as part of the 2022 motto. Like the believers in Thessalonica, there has to be love in action, faith in action, endurance in action, and repentance in action. Finally, the Thessalonian Christians, having turned away from idols towards serving the living God, are then waiting for the expected return of Christ from heaven. Brothers and sisters, this is an area that we may not really be focusing on. Do we long for our Lord's return? Are we prepared for his return? Or are we focused more on the daily grind of life? building our careers, taking care of our family and children, and looking forward to some leisure time, rest, or vacations. I do not mean to be critical of these things. We should be diligent in our jobs, diligent in taking care of our families, and have rest and a time of renewal. But I like to put it on our hearts to deeply and prayerfully consider where we are on this issue. Because where we stand on this issue will dictate the course and attitude of our lives. Jesus said he came to proclaim the kingdom of God. He lived and died with the humility of a servant and fulfilled the first part of his mission. But one day, the time for judgment will come. And as Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, verse 26, and they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. When he returns, it will not be as the suffering servant, but as the conquering king. I'll read this passage in Mark chapter 13, verses 32 to 37. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening, or at midnight, or when the crows, rooster crows, or in the morning. Lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. The NASB translate this, translates this last portion, be on alert. King James simply says, watch. This passage is not for the faint of heart. But if we love him and long for his return, while we are spiritually awake and living our lives for him, then we should have no issues with this. But if we're clinging to the priorities and pleasures of this world, then this is a frightening passage. He is the most important in our lives, brothers and sisters. And we will have to order our lives in a way that reveals his truth in us. Do we work? Absolutely. Who do we work for? We work for him. He is the ultimate owner. Do we take care of our families and love them? Absolutely. But who gave us our families? And for what purpose do we have them? It is for their eternal salvation. We are to take care of them for their eternal salvation. What do we do in this world that is absolutely not given to us by God nor connected to him? There is nothing. There is nothing. 
because if there is something, then we've carved this off from his kingdom, his sovereignty, his power. And so whose is it? Is it ours? And so then we will challenge God. Friends, we will come back to this. This will be a consistent theme. We need to prayerfully consider this. Because we really need to ask ourselves, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Where are we going? I heard this phrase many years ago, and it stuck with me. We are all one heartbeat away from eternity. This is a younger demographic, so thinking about things like this may be far from our minds. If the recent history has done anything, the amount of fear that's out there because of some disease should probably motivate us, not for that reason, but for the expectation that at some point, this ends, and then what? How are we prepared? And what are we doing today? Brothers and sisters, I don't want any of us to be the ones who are asleep when the Lord returns. Every one of us should be awake, alert, expectant, and hoping for his return. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, I pray that we will be the church that you want us to be. Be exemplary believers who exalt your name, who do your will, who honor you every day, who lift up our brothers and sisters who proclaim the gospel, who put faith in action, love in action. We show our endurance. We show our lives as lives where you are the owner. Lord, I pray for the brothers and sisters in this congregation that we are prepared. We will stay awake. We will be alert. We will watch with expectant hope for you. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
pray for the offer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for who you are, first and foremost, and not just for what you've given us. Simply because you are the great God of heaven, the one who made us, the one who loved us first, and who gave everything that we could. And so, Lord, we give. I pray that we give faithfully and that you will accept these offerings, offerings of love, of sacrifice, of worship. And Lord, that you will use them in the way that you see fit according to your perfect will. I pray that we will always be faithful with what you've given us, Lord, simply because we love you. Gracious Lord, we thank you for protecting us. We thank you for giving us opportunities in work and education and wherever they are, Lord. We pray to use these as good stewards of your faithfulness and not as owners. Lord, let us grow and mature in this way so that we draw ever closer to you. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For our corporate prayer topics, there are two. The first is, this is the new year, but I would like us to take a moment and remember and thank the Lord for all the answered prayer in 2021. We have a tendency to forget, but I really pray that we will remember his goodness in everything that he does. And the second, so that we be exemplary believers and a respected church. Now the church does not need the applause of a fallen world. Respected church is respected in his eyes and in those of the other believers that we do what is right in the eyes of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for all of your answered prayer. We thank you because of your wisdom and your perfect will. Give us patience when we see our prayer requests. Do we think they're not answered? Do we think the answer is no? Give us wisdom to understand if that is the case. And a heart of thankfulness for whatever your answer is. But Lord, if we look deeply, we will see your goodness everywhere and how you answer our prayers. And Lord, this year and going forward, we pray to be exemplary believers. 
and a respected and honorable church. Exemplary in faith and endurance in love. Exemplary in building up the body of Christ. Exemplary in standing for your word in an ever darkening world. Lord, I pray that each and every member take heart and be strong in your power and your might. And that we, Lord, are spiritually alert and awake. We are ever watchful and we pray and love your return. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated for the uh, announcement. Good to see everyone. Um, if, if anyone are new or visiting, please um, uh, see us on the way out. Uh, we want to welcome you. Um, please um, join our Bible reading group for those who may not be familiar with it. We do have a Kakao Talk uh, sign up, um, and it is a, a accountability group, really. Um, we post our uh, Bible reading on a daily basis or whenever you can. Uh, it's really trying to encourage one another to um, uh, read the scripture uh, every day. So if you're interested, uh, please let one of the core uh, leaders know. Uh, we would love to invite you to the group um, to do so. Father-wise, we'll be beginning shortly, um, so if you are interested, please um, see Elder Song, and, and he will get you connected. We have photos for the handbook. Uh, none of, uh, for some reason, no one stopped by last week, so we are extending it one more week. So on your way out, please, uh, we need actually updated photos for every single one of you, so please um, stop by. We have a post-it on the floor. Uh, Julie will stop you on the way out. There's a little... Uh, name tag, and so we'll, we'll, it'll be quick, it'll be short, um, but please, uh, we, we want to get uh, your latest photos in our handbook. So it'll be this week and next week, um, so, so if uh, we don't get you, we'll get you next week. Thank you for those who uh, uh, offer to help. So we did get some volunteers um, to serve. We, we still have a lot of need in the ministry, uh, especially in praise and worship, uh, and also some administrative work. So if you are praying about this and, and really have some questions, please let the core leaders know and then we'll get you connected. Uh, and lastly, um, we share the newly appointed uh, deacons uh, list with everyone. Uh, we will do that next week as well. Um, I think if you're newly appointed, you are I would like to once again thank everyone who has accepted the deacon appointments for 2022. Uh, we will have more to say upon this in, in our series, but uh, I look forward to serving together with everybody. Once we have the official forms out, uh, we will do a prayer for those who accepted, uh, and then we will look forward to serving faithfully together. If you could please rise with me for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.